Uh, good afternoon, I'm Rosanna Norman from Giant and uh, one of the organizers of the Cybersecurity Month campaign, Cyber Hero at Home. Cybersecurity Month is an initiative, as you know, probably by, launched by ENISA, the European Agency for Cybersecurity. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Giant, just let me give you some little background. Giant is uh, the organization that delivers uh, a worldwide network and a portfolio of services for research and education. And uh, we operate a pan-European infra infrastructure, which is called the Giant Network, and run a membership association for Europe's national research and education networks, the NRENS, and it's called the Giant Association. Cyber Hero at Home is the campaign from and for the Giant community, and its objective is to help users uh, to operate in a digitally safe home working environment to protect and defend their devices, their network, their identity, and in general, to be more aware of cybercrime and uh, cybersecurity. Every one of us can be a cyber hero. This is the core of the, the, of the message of our campaign. And uh, this is um, week three of the campaign, and the focus is uh, on protect your devices. And uh, the title of this week's webinar is Data Sharing Hygiene and Its Implications for Security. It will be given by, presented by Carolina Fernandez and Neil Ortiz from I2K in Barcelona. So, talking about digital hygiene, every digital interaction leads a digital trail, uh, which contain pers contains personal data that has been left behind even without our, our, our con conscious consent. So, digital hygiene is the correct handling of the data that we share in the digital world. So but we need to be mindful on the information we share, we consent, with whom, and for which specific reason, purpose. So thankfully we have here with us, Carolina and Neil, who will provide techniques aiming to empower all of us to have a better understanding and, to pro and how to protect our digital identity. The webinar will last one hour, including 15 minutes Q&A. And as I said before, please, you can use the Q&A function of, the, or, or, of Zoom and, uh, or the chat. So happy listening. And Carolina and Neil, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Rosanna. Um, I will share my screen. Let me know if you are able to see the slides. We can see the slides. Perfect. So as Rosanna mentioned before, uh, we are going to give a um, brief webinar on the uh, best practices on data sharing, uh, what it means for uh, security, and a bit also on, on privacy. OK. So uh, first of all, we are going to have uh, two sections on determine how much um, our personal data is uh, exposed over the internet, then um, to assess um, proper adequate processing of our personal data, then move to two sections, which are security related, identifying security issues related with uh, the, the data that is being processed or exposed, and how to communicate security issues to the, to the IT team. Uh, well, brief intro of ourselves. Um, we're working in the uh, I took at Foundation. It's uh, one of the entities collaborating with uh, Jan through Redidis, and uh, we have participated in different uh, well research projects uh, and then virtualization and uh, <clears throat> security, especially for Neil, which is a cybersecurity innovation expert, and he has been working in in SOX. So the real deal. <laughs> Now uh, to get an introduction, uh, first we're going to uh, inform about the basic terms that we should be um, well uh, knowing. First, uh, on the digital identity, we could call it like a set of attributes that represent us or any other entity for that matter. Some of the so-called laws of identity uh, created by this guy, Kim Cameron, uh, in 2005, uh, really aligned with uh, privacy and data protection, well, uh, best practices. So first of all, uh, user consent is key. 
I mean, anything has to be processed with our consent if it's, of course, our data. Uh, the minimum information and uh, should be disclosed and uh, it should be used only where necessary. And also when processed, uh, this information should only be disclosed to those parties that are justified, not to everyone. So we can say that uh, less disclosed information is more secure and private. I mean, the less data that is exposed, uh, more privacy will we have in a way and definitely more security because we have less chances of uh, leaking more data. Now, uh, privacy, that's a bit of an ethereal concept, but basically it's, uh, well, managing when, how, for which purposes and how much information we communicate to others. That um, relates a lot to this right to informal self-determination. Uh, so we define which data are we showing to others. Another thing to consider from privacy is that uh, some categories that uh, people have been doing is um, Hard privacy that uh, tries to minimize the data. So this is uh, what I would uh, try to transmit here. This is the part that we can control. And then we have the soft privacy, which is, um, well, since you are already giving away your data, so others can uh, use it for giving you services, for instance, uh, at least uh, it has to support some properties or rights uh, given to you as a an user. So this part would be the GDPR part. We'll go uh, through that as well. Now, uh, what do we call digital hygiene? Uh, well, I would say it's, it's uh, practices and behaviors related to keeping uh, your digital life clean up and uh, ordered. So basically the same you could do uh, physically with uh, everything you own. Uh, you categorize it, uh, you know where it is, you know others have no access to it unless you want it. Uh, we have the same here. So in this case, uh, keeping your information accurate and uh, also uh, let's say consistent what, with what you expect to expose, not any more information. Maybe at a given point in time, uh, you wish to, I don't know, share your location, but uh, later on you don't want to. So you have to keep track of this overall your accounts. Also, um, well, deleting uh, or locking down temporarily social media accounts <clears throat> or you use, you use services that uh, you're not uh, making use of anymore. And also introducing uh, other applications or technologies that can make your digital life a bit easier or more ordered, uh, like, uh, well, password managers, this is one in a way, uh, locking applications so that, uh, well, the same way you are locking your, uh, let's say, online, uh, well, your, your bank account, your bank card, sorry, uh, you could also lock some of the accounts so no one can uh, do anything uh, there. There are some apps for that. So now uh, GDPR, which uh, relates to what I mentioned before, this of privacy. Uh, this is basically this uh, European uh, regulation and data protection, uh, basically protecting the rights of the data on the persons and uh, also the free movement of personal data within the EU and also regulations uh, for transnational data exchanges. So just uh, to have in mind, uh, we as users, we are data subjects, okay? We own our data and we have a set of rights. And there, uh, then we have the data controllers, uh, which decide how the data uh, for a service, for instance, is acquired and processed, and the data processor, which will uh, keep and uh, use the data on behalf of, of the controller. So we are uh, seeding our data in favor of the, these two. But uh, of course, they have some uh, obligations. Now, uh, another important fact to have in mind uh, in GDPR is the separation of different types of data. We have the normal personal data. So anything that can identify back to us could be personal data. Of course, this depends on, um, well, per country. I mean, some countries, I don't uh, think that the IVAN account number for the bank account is personal, others do not. But it all depends on uh, whether correlating data 
or directly, you know, like the name of or an email address uh, which has our name and surname could be a personal one. Now, special categories, of course, anything that is, uh, you know, uh, well, religious, uh, medical records, of course, uh, criminal, whatever uh, that is special or sensitive. Uh, Non-personal data, well, everything that does not uh, fit into these categories. Now, uh, something very useful, both for um, uh, to know, to identify which uh, data is exposed and also for security purposes is uh, OSINT, which is open source intelligence. Basically, whatever that uh, we can find from public data sources. Uh, this is used uh, by many different profiles, let's say, First of all, you know, probably the uh, thews that uh, wish to attack. So they can be doing uh, profiling from, uh, from the social networks, doing social engineering based on this profiling and doing also some reconnaissance of uh, networks and systems. So they can uh, identify like a network uh, inside. Uh, also security on the defending part, like the pen testers and investigation, which are more, well, defensive and um, and uh, obtaining information, but for inucos, uh, sorry, not non harmful ways. And uh, finally, uh, the, well, you know, the curious people that uh, peeps, uh, well, other people, maybe, I don't know, colleagues from work on the, or older friends or ex, uh, you know, partners, or even yourself. So the, the latter one we're going to <clears throat> see later, a brief example. Okay, let's go to the first section. Uh, first of all, we have to determine how much data uh, we have there. So this data could be uh, provided by ourselves uh, when we create a, a service, open an account. So to identify that we can just keep our registry of services or use some uh, service like a uh, well, password manager that will have um, a credential for each of the services we have. Uh, or otherwise we can use other te techniques like uh, searching in uh, mailbox for registration emails, trying to access the sites if we remember or check uh, you know, sites like have I been owned, uh, which uh, maybe you uh, were part of a data leak and you didn't know because uh, it was a very old account you had back in time. <clears throat> and that can be also a useful source. And also to identify other uh, persons from others or your own uh, presence. If uh, maybe you didn't provide data, but uh, some uh, web scraping uh, scanning service uh, took some information from you and it, they registered it in their website, you can use these uh, OSINT tools and the engines, uh, search engine dorks, uh, which will uh, be shown later. So, well, motivation, uh, of course. Um, if we know which services and which data we have on the internet, what do we have to control? Well, we can think that, uh, if we have uh, an understanding uh, of what we have, it will give us more control on uh, on what we can on what we have around and how to control it. So in the end, it leads to better decisions, and better decisions on our data management can he help us uh, keeping a better digital hygiene. Now. Uh, some considerations we should have uh, on the online presence or basically on the on the data that uh, we have is that uh, when we share our own data, we should, of course, provide a minimum amount of information required for a service. Um, well, probably a service that not need, does not need to know our physical address, for instance. Maybe it does not even need to know our phone, for instance. And we should question ourselves which data could be obtained from uh, public data. I mean, public data that we provide in our profiles and uh, is made uh, public in the social networks or even private data, which could be uh, found in a data leak uh, years after uh, when there is an exploited bug on a, on a service. When we think about others' data, we should consider the same as our uh, 
the same considerations as for our data, but also the legal framework, because if it's not our data and we are using it, we are disclosing it, we could be uh, entering disclosure of secrets, revealing them, uh, modifying or impersonating people and so on. So of course, this is, um, this is very, um, something to be very careful about. So you would not like to share, <laughs> like some people do, uh, some uh, intimate videos or other people. And uh, surprisingly, there are people who consider that uh, sharing some uh, pictures, even from uh, underage, um, you know, um, underage um, persons in the in the school, uh, they think it's not uh, it's not an issue, and it is. Uh, this kind of thing should be handled very seriously. So besides the personal data and this kind of image related stuff that I just mentioned, we should consider uh, business data. This is not personal data, but uh, we have to be aware that we may be under a non-disclosure agreement or we may have uh, any other type of contract uh, in our organization. So <clears throat> when we post online some of this data, uh, we should also ask ourselves uh, which uh, categories of information can we disclose, uh, if this can put at risk some, I don't know, uh, the, the company itself, uh, some project, whatever. So we should consider uh, the internal actions of the company, of course, and the applicable legal framework in our country. Uh, this example that you can see in the right, uh, in the right side, this is from... Um, uh, well, an online tank uh, gaming that uh, apparently they were debating on the, how well uh, the, a tank model was done. And uh, some of them were trying to win the argument by uh, revealing some uh, secret data. Uh, for them, it was, uh, well, confidential data. So uh, we should be aware that the personal dynamics of uh, Things like uh, winning an argument, winning revenge by disclosing data can lead to uh, serious stuff. Okay, now uh, let's go for the OSINT techniques. Uh, I mentioned before the search engine dorks. Uh, this can really help us uh, finding data from ourselves and from others on the, on the internet. So <clears throat> some examples that you could use is like uh, <clears throat> inserting your name in text and maybe try to find some reports generated from uh, your organization and a given uh, date uh, range. So I tried this in my organization uh, some, uh, some weeks ago, in fact, and I could find some uh, very old document uh, I lost track about, and it was very funny to see them. And also you can see well contributions from GitHub and uh, I don't know, Twitter po posts uh, and so on. Other tools that you can use and that uh, attackers uh, and, and others, of course, use are things like uh, the harvester. So you can input a domain there, like uh, our organization, and find in Google or in LinkedIn. And you could say, uh, you could see, well, different uh, level of uh, results there. In Google, there are very few uh, entries, but if you go to LinkedIn, uh, you get a, a long uh, list of uh, employees. So if someone were to attack any organization, probably they would do this first reconnaissance and try to find uh, you know, persons and uh, go deeper in their social networks, see what they like, uh, profile them and approach them. Some other tools and combinations uh, of tools that uh, can be used uh, are mentioned here. So basically you could uh, get a phone number from email. This is made from the, for, for United States because the guy is living there. Uh, <clears throat> getting credentials using uh, two other uh, data sources. So have um, I been owned and the ghost project. And uh, also get some uh, metadata on the phone of a person, um, getting history uh, from social network accounts and many, many, many others are available. Some considerations on OSINT uh, is that, first of all, uh, these tools are frequently changing. They get deprecated very quickly uh, because some of them scrape web data. 
and uh, well, the structure of the web data changes, so the tools uh, cannot be operative. Uh, also, the multiple data requests that uh, you may be doing when using such data can lead to temporal blocking uh, from some services. This is a way of uh, that services use to protect protect themselves and and well the the users. And uh, also uh, that uh, as you can see in the right side, uh, apparently. Well, search engines track uh, every action that we query, right? So this, uh, under some uh, court warrant, at least in USA, uh, this could lead to uh, us uh, being in a in an issue if we found uh, if we if we were trying to find information of a person that uh, would be a victim or something or related to something fishy, let's say. So now, second section to assess uh, what is an adequate processing of our personal data in the services that we consume in, on the internet, we should have some considerations on privacy. Okay, this, uh, uh, the, um, the left column, uh, it shows uh, three properties, uh, which are very uh, interesting, which are basically to avoid linking personal data uh, between domains or services, um, the control, the, the transparency, which uh, uh, is a service indicating how they collect and process uh, the data, and uh, the control or intervenability, which is uh, empowering us, uh, the, the end users, on our data processing. So all of this, the minimization, the control, and inform, you should be able to grasp some information of them from the privacy notice section. Each site must have their own, and this can give us some information. You can see it here. From the outside, we can get some um, idea of uh, what the data is being used for and how it is processed. Some uh, GDPR principles and rights. I'm going to go very quickly on this. I'm not going to explain GDPR. This is just for you to know that uh, there are some guiding principles that uh, we as users should also have in mind you know, data minimization, uh, purpose limitation, transparency and how our data is being used, uh, limit uh, how much time uh, it is stored and that is, uh, you know, properly secured. These are the, the principles. And we also have some user rights, uh, which are know which personal data we have, uh, right? If you go to some, I think Facebook, at least last time when I entered that, they allowed you to uh, export all the data they had from you. So this is a way to know it as well. Uh, and you can exercise your rights of uh, rectification, uh, let's say update your data, uh, restrict the amount of data they process, uh, delete it, uh, opposed to processing. And uh, a very interesting one, which is uh, gaining relevance right now, is the uh, one to not be profiled or subject to automated individual decision-making. So, well, uh, right now, uh, more and more, we have a lot of automated processes, which, uh, I don't know, for speaking from the gen side, let's say automation, orchestration, virtualization, that's great. But uh, it poses quite uh, a number of ethical uh, questions, let's say considerations, when it's applied to humans. And this is what uh, we could have in mind, right? That some of these uh, big and not so big companies are using that for uh, firing, uh, promoting or demoting. And uh, this can be uh, really a problem. I mean, uh, if we are, um, I mean, because basically this use profiling, right? As uh, the law making, it targets a specific community. And if you move away from that community, you are going to be especially vulnerable. So this is something to be uh, aware of. Uh, we are not to be, we have the right not to be profiled or subject to, to uh, decisions based on automated uh, profiling and, and actions. Uh, now, very quickly, uh, another consideration on GDPR you should have in mind when uh, exerting your rights on your uh, online data is that, uh, well, you could see it in the, in the right um, graphic that uh, let's say that there are three actors, right? Us, the users, the services that uh, we have online, for instance, and the society and the administration. 
So let's say that uh, this uh, body of flows uh, try to um, try to uh, how to say balance uh, the interest of the difference involved actors. So the three of them. So there are uh, some uh, you know stretching here and there to make it work. So for instance, um, well the uh, a data processor, let's say, uh, the one providing a service to you could have a legitimate interest. Uh, this is very, I mean, if you, if you open the cookies in a website and you check it, uh, you will see a long list uh, that uh, may be by default uh, enabled that they can use your data on legitimate interest. So be aware on that. I mean, they can, depending on, on, on some considerations and, and their motivations, so basically, this is a trade-off. It's not a black or white. Uh, it's, uh, well, very gray. Uh, also, some considerations when you create accounts on these services is that, uh, well, of course, services uh, have to make some profit. And, uh, well, the business model of uh, companies are different from each of them. As you can see here in the intermediate graphic, uh, Alphabet has an 88% uh, revenue on ads and Facebook a 97%. So have that in mind when you use uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, well, of course, Google products. Uh, an example of that uh, is in fact here. Uh, you can see which data is linked to you in the different, uh, let's say, messaging applications. Signal apparently has known uh, iMessage, which I guess it's uh, from Apple. It has just a couple of things. WhatsApp uh, have a lot of analytics and then a lot for the app functionality. And Facebook Messenger, it has, well, uh, an awful lot of them for uh, at up to five different purposes. So this kind of information we can get uh, from the privacy notice uh, on the website. Uh, if we already have a service, uh, we can export this data. And uh, some mobile-based apps like, uh, I guess, Signal, Message, and WhatsApp, uh, I don't know this one, uh, could uh, provide some hints before uh, for the permissions. Uh, here, in fact, uh, for Apple, apparently they were introducing these uh, labels to better indicate which uh, data they are using and for what. And uh, Google Play is to add these privacy levels as way uh, by 2022. So as you can see, what uh, one company does, uh, others may replicate. So it is important to indicate that us as users can also have a way to move uh, such organizations uh, to move to the, let's say, right track to minimize our data processing and handle it carefully, and also to inform us, uh, let's say, in any easier ways. So this is a, a good example. Another practical example uh, that I want to showcase is that um, not only companies, but even public administrations can be um, can be wrong. Uh, they can be processing or asking us for data that they don't need, okay? So this is one example. Uh, this is um, a portal from uh, asktheeu.org. So citizens can ask uh, European Commission about um, what they are doing. In this case, this is a Berlin citizen that is asking uh, for anything, uh, any relation to the Panther Technologies, which is a US-based company involved in a number of um, controversies uh, over the years, okay, on artificial intelligence. So first of all, they ask uh, the guy for the postal address and the guy answers, hey, uh, it has no legal basis because uh, the ombudsman office, it, they declared an, uh, maladministration. So they answer back, they say, okay, fine, we have, a, we have an address, uh, so we are not asking you. And this is the address. Uh, th this is anonymized here, but uh, this was a postal address. So, well, in fact, yes, the ombudsman um, office, they declared it maladministration. They should not have asked for this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can also think uh, like, uh, does it really make sense when I'm making uh, a request over the internet to have a paper-based uh, reply? 
or maybe you know just using an um, electronic certificate and accessing a portal, maybe that's better uh, to have a justification. Well, you can think about that. Okay, so this is so far for the uh, more privacy related stuff and we're going to the full fledged uh, security issues. Uh, I'm leading the work for to, to Neil. Hey, thank you, Carolina. Uh, so yeah, now we'll move into the part where we will see how we can identify security issues related to our personal data and what to do with them. So first of all, I, I would like to, to start kind of classifying the environments where we move ourselves within this digital world. So we should start classifying uh, these environments into three categories. So we could mm, establish some personal environment, a work environment, and a social network environment. And then if we have this classification, uh, we can see that our activity there and our data there, it's uh, uh, very different from each other. So if we, if we start asking ourselves uh, these questions about <clears throat> What applications are we using on this environment? What kind of data are we sharing? Uh, what kind of attacks are most common in these environments? And how frequent are, are these attacks? And how, who could be interested in our data? We can start to have a, a solid understanding of these environments and their risk because it, it's very different what we see uh, usually from people on, on the work environment and on the social networks. And even if it's the same person, it, it doesn't really feel like it, it's actually the same person will, when you're speaking to someone on a personal level or on a work level, or especially on social networks, where it, it's harder to, to link the identity behind that account to, to an actual person. <clears throat> so if we move to the next slide. So in here, for example, we could see the kind of activities or accounts that we could embed into each environment. So for example, on the personal environment, we'll put our personal email service, uh, or bank account, or healthcare system service, uh, the only stores, any gaming accounts that we may have, uh, or Netflix, anything related to strictly our personal activity and uh, everything related to leisure. And then moving into the work environment, <clears throat> I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but uh, it's everything that we use when we are actively working. And it could be even the, the applications that we use during our daily jobs or the publications that we may do and even the, the work phone that we use, if it's different from our personal world, our personal phone. So there it could be not only the, the actual number, but the kind of applications that we have on that phone and the kind of data that we are managing on that phone. And of course, uh, social networks uh, like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, I think everyone is pretty familiar with all, with all of this. And for best practices, I would say it's very important to try to keep every environment isolated from themselves. So even if like someone has access to uh, or work information, let's say, they kind of have to make an effort to, to get to our personal environment or from our social network, they can't really link us to our work environment or to our personal environment, right? We'll move to the next one. So now uh, let's see how we can actually track potential incidents because it's very important that we know <coughs> what's happening around ourselves and, and around the world because even on your day to day, if you see that the house uh, near your, your own house, it's being robbed or there's a storm on the other side of, of the city or it's anything, any incident is happening around yourself, you, you will try to increase the, 
your own security uh, and see what would you do if it was you that were a victim <coughs> of that incident, right? So it makes sense to do the same in the in the digital world as well. So for example, uh, right now we can see that even the most uh, general news um, within their own site or on TV or, or uh, even uh, on newspapers, they are already covering the most important cybersecurity incidents, but it, it's still nice to try to keep track of, of them. And for example, if we use uh, some kind of niche applications, uh, like for example, uh, Jira or Confluence, or something, very some application very special on our work, uh, we still might need to go and look for uh, that information uh, specifically into specialized sites. Also, peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. So just like talking to people about these kind of things can keep everyone informed. Even if your colleagues uh, have uh, no initial interest in these kind of things, uh, just uh, trying to spark this, the conversation and tell them about the incident that you hear uh, the other day uh, might uh, bring them up to speed and might spark the, the interest uh, on these topics on them. And maybe the next day, it will be them who will approach you and tell you about uh, an incident that happened and that could potentially impact you. Also, uh, social media, especially Twitter, I would say, uh, it's where almost everyone is supporting these kind of things. Uh, probably when everything goes down, the first thing that you check is Twitter. Right? If Netflix is not working, uh, you go into Twitter to see if other people are having the same issue. Well, the same is with cybersecurity incidents. Whenever there's any kind of issue that is affecting a lot of people, uh, on social media will be the first place where you will see kind of the, the outrage of the masses uh, trying to, to get a hold of what's happening. And of course, uh, we can also use Google Docs, which Carolina explained uh, a little before. And just changing a little bit the information that we look for could be, could be enough to find a lot of specific information about what we're interested. For example, if we were to be looking for security threats or incidents related to our university, uh, it would be very easy just with a quick sentence or the same for an application or a service. If we move to the next one. OK, so one thing that's very important to, to understand is that we can still be impacted by security incidents, even if ourselves, like we didn't do anything to compromise uh, our accounts. Like we can get compromised by by mass attacks where we're just one of the victims and it's the service provider fault or maybe uh, it's no one fault and kind of uh, randomly happened. Like there's many ways where we can still be impacted. So it's important that we don't put blame on the users or even onto ourselves. Uh, but we still can do uh, a lot of things to try to minimize the impact of any security incident that may happen within our domain and using our data. So as we said before, uh, separating identities from different environments, it's very important because if your information about uh, on LinkedIn uh, gets leaked and turns out uh, now the whole world knows uh, your, your, your work email and the password that you use there, uh, maybe you are also using uh, the same credentials on another platform or, or your own personal email, and this will get tested. There will be people actively uh, trying to search among all these leaked data and trying to find correlations on other services. So for this, it's also very important to use different credentials for every account. Like even if you have uh, 30, 40, 50 accounts, uh, it's important to use different credentials. And of course, uh, use like passwords and 
any kind of credential that you use where it's uh, properly uh, secured, let's say, that it's a strong password, not 123. And for that, the best thing is to use credential managers because, for example, I only know um, the password of my laptop and my personal email password. Everything else, I have it on my credential manager and I have over there over 60 accounts. But uh, this way, I don't have to, to worry about what the password is. Uh, the, the manager knows and that's it. Also, right now we are seeing that most services, if I would say almost all services are, you, are allowing users to use multi-factor authentication. So when you can uh, authorize uh, your logins or your actions via using an OTP token or even your mobile, this is, this is very, very useful to, to reduce the impact of any security incidents because even if your credentials get leaked, you still need to, to go through this multi-factor authentication. So we should be using it everywhere where it's available. Also, it's quite important to try to maintain uh, a backup policy. So not have not to have everything just sitting on our laptop or on some drive. Uh, if we have everything or almost everything stored on, on some cloud, whether it's uh, Google Drive or Amazon AWS or pretty much anywhere that it's not only on, on one spot, so keeping replicas of our documents will, will give us this uh, resiliency against security incidents. This way, we can, even if we have uh, some, some big incident where we kind of lose everything, we can still uh, maintain our, our activity. Also, of course, uh, avoid downloading files and apps from untrusted sites. I think this is becoming already common knowledge for, for everyone in this day and age, but it's nice to, to keep being aware of this and keep reminding people to only use trusted sites and use antivirus services. Like for example, uh, BiosTotal, it's a website where you can just upload any file and it will run this file across uh, multiple antivirus engines and give you uh, the score and, and ratings. So this is very useful. Uh, if we go to the next one. So now we'll speak a, a little bit about how to communicate the security issues to your IT team, because uh, most likely you, you will only be able to, to go so far to minimize security risks. And if something happened, it, it will be out of your reach to actually be able to remediate this risk. So now let, let's consider that we are compromised. And again, it may not be our fault. Uh, it doesn't have to be our fault and, and we shouldn't be embarrassed to contact the, our IT team or contact any security professional that can handle this. So when we acknowledge that we have been part of an incident that our data has been leaked, that we have any kind of security incident, the first things that we should do is always acknowledge the incident, uh, try to identify the source of the incident. This may be tricky, but if we can, uh, it will make things much simpler later. Then we should try to contain and recover. So if we know that our credentials have been leaked or that our data has been leaked, then we should try to uh, change the passwords, uh, try to update the data and try to protect it better, let's say. And of course, if we need to recover uh, using our backups, then uh, do so. And after we have done this kind of container recovery actions, we should move into the notification procedure. So every service and every team should have some kind of security procedure 
to, to notify the, the people in charge of the systems to, to be rich about these kind of issues. And then once we already notified the, the security team, we should take the steps to prevent the same from happening in the future. So what could we have done different to not be impacted in the first place? And maybe we should have a better backup policy, or maybe we should have a MFA implanted, or maybe we realized that we didn't really need to share all that information that we did because it wasn't really necessary for us to be able to use that service. Now, if we move to the next one. Now, when we contact uh, the IT or security team, uh, we need to realize that uh, they are people too, like working on, on these kind of issues. And uh, just if we just send them an email saying, hey, my account has been compromised, uh, what do I do? They, they won't really know what happened or how to handle it. We need to give them as much information as we can and make it as easy as we can for them. This way, they can work properly on the issue and it can be solved as fast as, as, fast as we can. So, as always, we should try to paint a picture of what happened uh, and tell the, the story as accurately as we can. For this, uh, we need to try to provide uh, these five uh, Ws that we see on many domains, like uh, who is it about, uh, what happened, when did it take place, where did it take place, why did it happen. It, it, it's all right if we don't have all the information, but the more we can give them, the better. Also, it's important to give them information about how they will learn of this incident, if we just saw it by Twitter or we write it on some news or maybe just uh, someone we know told us about it. <laughs> and if we already did some actions, also uh, they should know. This is kind of the same as when you go to see your doctor, uh, you just tell them the, the full information about what you do, uh, how did it happen, if you already took some medication, and of course, what kind of information we think might have been compromised that way they can already start working on this without having to go to, to a comprehensive background of the whole incident. And well, just to keep in mind that most companies, as we said before, already have security procedures. So if we use some service a lot, especially uh, within the work environment, I would say, it's nice to be familiar with this kind of procedures this way if something happened someday, we know that there is a, a response plan and that we just have to go through it. And this will help us reduce time and worry a, a little bit less. <coughs> so now this is uh, a fun exercise that you can do. <coughs> And this will be left as homework for when you have some time or when you are bored. So you, you can pretend that uh, one of your accounts has compromised. For example, in this year, we saw a LinkedIn data leak, which had uh, 700 million users um, being, being leaked their personal data, or Facebook also may uh, had 550 millions of personal of personal data of users leaked. So if this happened to you, uh, what would you do? And we could start just by checking the news, as we said before, uh, and reading about this news <coughs> to check what kind of information was compromised, uh, how many people was affected, what did these people do, not only what the company or what the security team did, but what did the people that was compromised do? And how was the incident result? If they applied other measures, if they reinforced the security, or maybe they just send a waiver about it. And then <clears throat> just ask yourselves, what would you do if this happened again tomorrow? Because it could, uh, there's no reason why after 
an incident on some company uh, happened that they properly secured everything and they didn't leave any gap. So we could see another leak on, on LinkedIn in a few months or the same for Facebook or any major company. So it, it's nice to already do this kind of uh, preventions. Go to the next. So to finalize, we will end up with some conclusions. So concluding this webinar, we've seen that users should understand which data is being collected and used uh, by services. So we can check the privacy notice for, for this. We, we know that users should review uh, whether the, the data uh, it's, it's really required to use on the services or it's excessive. Like we don't really need to give all the data they always ask. And then we should try to keep uh, the different environments isolated. So we are not able, we, they cannot be tracing us through our different profiles. And all of this it's to evaluate the cost benefit of creating an account because most of the time, we, we don't really need to, to create so many accounts on so many services. We can just try to reduce all the exposure that we are giving into the world. And this will allow us also to enhance, enhance our personal security and be able to, to report potential unreasonable treatment of our data to the proper authorities. And we will benefit from <clears throat> external knowledge on this business, on the business model in use and how our data it's being it's being processed for what reasons it's usually for marketing but as always it can also be used in in hard mode manner and well it's nice to be so aware of the procedures to report this kind of issues uh, this way we are much more aware of what what rights do we have and what do we need to exhort our rights and the regulations, the documentation and tools to exert our rights. <clears throat> and with these conclusions, we finalize our webinar. If there's any questions, uh, we will be happy to try to, to provide all the answers that we can. Thank you very much, uh, Neil and Carolina. It's been really exhaustive. Uh, you covered everything, you know, and uh, so many useful tips, uh, useful information, and uh, I'm glad you've given us some homework to do as well. So really, fundamentally, we all have rights, and we need to know how to exercise the rights when it comes to the hand handling of our data, because uh, we need to treat our data, you know, like treasure. You know, it's, it's precious. Data is precious. So um, um, that's been great. Um, so if you, there is any, is there anybody who would like to ask a, a question? Uh, please pop it into the Q and A or um, or in the chat or let us know. And uh, if, if you, you can also leave anonymous uh, uh, requests uh, if you don't want to, your name to be seen. So we will wait for a little longer and then ah just uh, we'll, I will let you know that this. Um, uh, webinar has uh, been recorded and it will be made available um, uh, in the next couple of days. It will be distributed to all the participants and then you'll be, you'll be able then to share it uh, as you wish and we will save it on a, it's in a, it will be on a YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. Um, so wait for some questions. In the meantime, I may add that, uh, well, as uh, an, another um, summarizing uh, items that, uh, well, first of all, as Neil said, uh, yes, have uh, different accounts, like different emails for your different identities and uh, the different uh, actions you do online. Like, uh, let's say that uh, you're using your one for legal stuff. Uh, another one for, you know, service registration, which uh, is likely to have uh, a lot of marketing uh, on it. And uh, maybe a different one for uh, personal purposes. 
And also don't be shy uh, to ask service providers, uh, I mean, uh, you know, websites, when they are asking for too much data uh, or even communicating that to your data protection authority because uh, it may be needed to report uh, some if they are not, uh, you know, allowing you your rights after a given time, you know, like uh, one month, if they don't fulfill the request, you may report them and maybe uh, they will take actions to, to make that right. Yeah, and always, yeah, well, be sure that um, us as user have the, well, the power uh, through our actions, you know, like uh, with this uh, butterfly effect, if someone does that and uh, enough number of people preserve, uh, try to preserve their rights and uh, pressure to do that, we will save time in the future for ourselves and others because uh, best practices will be in place by companies and yes. organizations. <laughs> No, that's great. Absolutely. And also, you know, the more we talk about these things, the more we make them um, reach the, you know, sort of the mainstream, make them mainstream, the more I enter in the in the in the culture and then the way, you know, people do things, you know. So all this, the more we talk about it, the better. So, yes, absolutely. And thanks very much. I mean, you dedicate, you know, you have put a lot of effort in, in this presentation and your knowledge is very deep of, of the subject. Uh, I saw there were uh, something in the chat. Ah, okay, we were just reminding uh, there were some congratulations uh, regarding the session and uh, also a reminder that uh, next week we have uh, um, a last, the last of our webinars and uh, it will be uh, held uh, at the same time, Thursday at uh, three o'clock uh, CEST. And it will be, um, the, the presenter will be uh, Stefan Luders, uh, who is the computer security officer from CERN. So um, we invite you all to, to join us again next week. So thank you very much and uh, see you next week. Thanks a lot, uh, Carolina and Neil. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks for inviting us. Time. It was a pleasure. Yeah.